Here we are. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is another episode of Mary Grace TV. I am Mary Grace, and I have with me today an awesome guest. Uh, many of you know and love our friend Sam Faddis, also known as Sam the Spy. So this is another episode of Spy Talk, and we have no shortage of topics to go over today. Welcome back to the show, Sam. Good to have you here. Great to be here, man. When I see that intro with you playing the guitar, it makes me think of <laughs> you walking up to the stage and in eerie and just blowing everybody away, singing that song you wrote about. I think the trucker's yes. convoy, right? Yes, 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 yes. And that that's another area of my life that is uh, is needs more attention. <laughs> um, just getting the music out there. So just keep encouraging me. Um, I, I'm I'm so grateful that we got the the audio here on the show dialed in because we had some dicey moments. Just speaking of you know technical and and yeah. audio and things like that, uh, I'm very grateful for that. And uh, it's just a little bit at a time, right? Just one day at a time. It's good to see people in the chat here. We've got Linda and Facebook. Uh, more people coming in. Uh, Facebook is up to their usual shenanigans. And again, I had to throw a puppy video up the other day to sort of juice the algorithm and um, that helps. But the thing that you can do as an audience is you can share, you can put this on your timeline, you can subscribe to the channel, you can hit the likes, uh, the hearts while we're doing this live stream. All of that helps. The other thing you can do when you come back after the fact is you can leave a comment in, in the comments section, because that actually helps it go up in the algorithm in the feed. Same thing on YouTube. Uh, we want to reach as many people as we can. And so we do persist on these platforms, even though they they hate us. Um, but we're, we're not going to stop. We're also on Rumble. We're in lots of places. If you don't want to miss a show, the best thing you can do is go to marygracemedia.com and get on my mailing list. That way you will get an email before we go live and you don't have to rely on these big tech behemoths to remind you that there is a good show on marygracemedia.com. So Sam, we, we just found out before the show went live, we got the breaking news about the case in Fulton County. This is a case where President Trump uh, is the, the accused, the defendant, but he actually put the prosecutor on defense, uh, accusing them of impropriety and conflict of interest. This is Big Fonnie Willis uh, by hiring her lover and, and having a financial benefit from this case. Uh, this is an interesting case because any sane person would look at it and see that, you know, it, it's not a criminal case, it's a civil case. So you don't have to have a preponderance of evidence. All you need is an appearance of impropriety. And that was happening in spades. However, the news just came out. Uh, Judge McAfee, Mc, McAfee, McAfee rules in Fulton. Okay. So judge rules Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis and entire staff must step aside or special prosecutor Nathan Wade must withdraw from the Trump Trump case. So he's not dismissing it. He is giving them a choice. What say you about this as as a as an attorney? The truth is coming out. Sam's an attorney. <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, he has worked in the legal profession. Um, and so he understands a little bit about what's going on here. What's your take? Yeah, well, well, that is the skeleton in my closet. It's not the whole CIA thing or, you know, covert action or overthrowing governments. It's that <laughs> before I ever got into that business, Forget about one that. of the many things I had done before I ended up in the CIA was I was I was a practicing trial attorney. I mean, I was a JAG officer and I spent a lot of time in court. Um, look, let me give you a legal technical term. It's garbage. I mean, the, it's just cut to the chase on this and all of these other legal actions around the country. They're, they're garbage. They're, you know, it's just a perversion of justice. And the thing is, these people, these people know that. I mean, it's like the New York case, right, where they get this judgment for whatever it is, hundreds of millions of dollars against Trump. You know, if you talk to these guys, you talk to these folks the, behind closed doors and they were actually inclined to be candid. I'm sure they would admit that, look, man, the chances that this judgment will ever actually stick and that 
and 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 survive appeal are virtually nil but it doesn't matter because while they're masquerading as legal actions they're political and the point is not just smear trump but try to get it it's basically you know death by a thousand cuts let's bankrupt him let's take his money let's destroy his reputation let's see if we can knock him off the ballot you know with just collective wounds and the only thing that we have to do is sustain this effort until november of 2024 and after that it doesn't matter so they can all vaporize and two years from now every one of these cases could have been thrown out and dismissed it, it won't make any difference so it's you know this is transparently what well, you're talking about this specific case a politically motivated case with a whole stack of ethical issues that ought to have destroyed it this is the judge's ruling is meaningless right i mean they'll throw this dude off the case and trundle along and and basically ignore all of of the issues i this is one of those things that every american regardless of where you are in the political spectrum ought to really really be troubled by right because this idea that we're weaponizing we have weaponized the justice system for political purposes because there's no there's no end to this right i mean the end to this is the end of the republic right you just right it, the, the, no rules apply and we don't solve things at the ballot box we solve things this way and the next you know and the next thing you know you're you're taking donald trump in i mean not in this case as you say it's a civil case but then you know you're about five seconds away from trump being arrested handcuffed taken away thrown in a prison cell and we're a banana republic like the the, the yeah. or half of west africa that's that's where we are we're like right on the precipice and and i think that uh, you know i was at an event over the weekend uh and general flynn was talking and he he was talking about you know his situation where that he went through and he has a movie coming out about it and he was describing what happened as an assassination yeah. it's just that there's no body yeah. right there's no cold body and then he said what what they're doing to president trump is an assassination yeah. and because they can't they know that that if they if they actually assassinate him they will make a martyr out of him but what i don't think they realize is that they've already yeah. done that 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 by continuing and persisting down this line they are creating more trump fans every single day especially among minorities because I believe that any any defendant, any criminal defendant in Fulton County specifically, mm -hmm. who has been wronged by an unethical prosecutor such as Fonnie Willis, I, I believe that them and also their defense lawyers were probably hoping for Fonnie to get dismissed from this case because it would have a, a strong impact on their own cases, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, if because the fact is, if she's acting this way, if she's behaving this way on a case that has uh, really historic implications, how does she handle the propriety and ethics of just the, the run of the mill cases, the murder cases, these types of things? She can talk a good talk, but her actions have shown otherwise. And so if I'm a criminal defendant waiting for my day in court, I am cheering for Donald Trump. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, regardless yeah. of my skin color. And yeah, so well, I believe I, that this decision, yeah, go ahead. I, I think it's, well, I, I, it I think bigger, I, longer implications. I think you're absolutely right. And, and what people, you know, shifting back into lawyer mode for, for a moment. Yeah. One of the things that people really, I mean, I think they, they understand this as a matter of common sense, but understand from a purely legal standpoint. Our criminal justice system is based on this adversarial, it's an adversarial system. So you have a prosecutor whose job it is to prosecute somebody and you have a defense counsel whose obligation is to the defendant. Okay. A defense counsel still has ethical limitations on what they can do. But the bottom line is, you know, if you're my lawyer and I'm being charged with something within the bounds of, of ethics, which means you can't deliberately tell a known 
untruth. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to lie or falsify. There are limitations, but bottom line is your only real obligation is to fight like hell for me. A prosecutor is a fundamentally different animal in the system. A prosecutor's obligation is not just like if you're prosecuting me, your your obligation is not just to see if you can put me behind bars. You have an absolute ethical responsibility requirement that you have to see that justice is done. So if you're prosecuting me, uh, everybody knows my cousin Vinny, right? One of the great movies of 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 our yes. generation. Okay. At the end, the way that case is resolved is the prosecutor dismisses the charges. After after all of the evidence is brought out that these two kids from Brooklyn, I think, are falsely accused, it doesn't go to the jury. The prosecutor dismisses the case. Well, the judge, he, he says he wants to dismiss the case, and the judge agrees, and they dismiss the action because the evidence has come to light that shows these kids were falsely accused. Okay. It's a comedy. I don't want to turn it into the great legal drama of our time. But the point is, that's actually the legally correct. By the way, My Cousin Vinny is one of the few trial movies that actually does bear some resemblance to the way a real tri trial. You know, I, I don't know that it does. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, if you discuss, the prosecutor is independently charged with seeing that justice is done. So right. you're, you got somebody nailed and you can put them behind bars for 100 years. But in the course of the case, you discover that that person is likely innocent. You don't have to you don't sit there and hide those cards and hope the defense counsel doesn't see them. No, you have an obligation to stand up. So mm -hmm. our and that's what's called exculpatory evidence, yeah, and, correct? And, but not just to divulge it. You yourself have to. I, okay. Anyway, so that's the standard against which you got to look at this is when, when you start looking at prosecutors and public, uh, you know, whether we're talking civil or criminal actions, but functioning basically in a prosecutorial mode, they, this is grotesque. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you ought to be disbarred for and go to prison for the abuse of the system. You're, you're the one who's supposed to say, Look, I hate Donald Trump and I will never vote for Donald Trump. But the bottom line is this is a garbage case and I'm not. Politics is irrelevant. I got an ethical an obligation here. So it's just mm -hmm. I'm trying to emphasize how far we have gone down this road to perverting the system. It's it's yeah. it's almost unthinkable. But yet we see it's true. And it's not just true in this case. It's true. I mean, how many cases are going on against Trump, either civil or criminal? I've lost track at this point all around the country in various ways. It's all right. pure political motivation. Well, and, and the narrative which, which is being pushed uh, by the political mouthpiece of, of the establishment that wants him gone. I'm not going to say just the left right. because there are many on the, on the conservative side who want him yes. gone and, and, there's a story that broke uh, yes the day before yesterday about infiltration of the GOP at the local level, and that's something you and I can talk about because you're very involved in that. Um, and uh, but but the fact is, you know, these people want him gone, and they they want it done at any cost. But what's happening is it's not just a cost to Trump; it's at a cost to the rule of law and to the very principles upon which our laws are, are based on, on our constitution. It's anti-constitutional what they're doing. And it's, you know, I, I mean, it's a constitutional crisis is what yes. it is. And it's happening on multiple yes. fronts. And, and, and I think that I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go so far as to say Donald Trump is the first person to be a victim of this. He absolutely isn't. And I believe that, that the fact that he isn't, and that it's happening so publicly is the reason that he's garnering so much support because the the little person who's waiting for months and sometimes years uh for trial and or sentencing knows exactly how yes. this system has been perverted but now they're doing it blatantly 
in your face in the open. And in the meantime, they are refusing to prosecute uh, criminals who have committed overtly heinous yeah. acts against American citizens. I, I just heard of a case in my area just this morning. I heard of a case where a man uh, was in a deranged state and uh, came to a neighbor's house when uh, a, the woman was alone uh -huh. and the man was violently threatening to attack her and, and do all kinds of things to her, et cetera. And, and the police were called, and this was a neighbor. And, and so we have a, a DA appointed prosecutor here, Commonwealth's attorney. They declined to prosecute this man because it turns out that he had, he was on something. And so they took an insanity case they turned it into an insanity case and declined to prosecute. This woman and her family have now left their home because they're afraid to be there. They're, they're instant, you know, in, in a moment overnight uh, in a position of selling their home and uprooting their entire lives because this person is not going to be prosecuted for putting her through hell. Yeah of the, the fear of, of being attacked by this man. So, but this is happening all over the country. So on the one hand, you have people that are falsely accused and that are rotting away like J sixers. Um, and then you have people, you have situations like this where there is an actual, actual evidence like video evidence of a crime being committed where they refuse to prosecute. So everything is upside down. I yes. mean, it, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you know, the, this legal principle of, of sort of I committed a crime because I'm under the influence of something, therefore it shouldn't be my fault kind of thing. I mean, speaking broadly, was resolved about a bazillion years ago in American jurisprudence. And uh, there may be some minor ways in which that is relevant. But the bottom line is the legal principle forever has been, um, sorry, mm -hmm. buddy you made the decision to get blind drunk let's take it back to the you know yeah. to to pre hallucinogenic days uh that you can't now use that as an excuse that so you consciously did that you committed the crime sorry you're stuck with the consequences right you've alluded a couple of times to to sort of overreach by the left here i think that's absolutely true not, not just in, in the sense of people look at the prosecution and the persecution of Donald Trump, but in general with their agenda. I mean, you know, I was, uh, as part of the Pennsylvania Patriot Coalition stuff that you've, you've helped with and that I'm involved with heavily around the Commonwealth. I was down what, two weeks ago now as part of our outreach into Philadelphia that Bill Allen, our outreach coordinator has been spearheading. And he's really been reaching out now for, well, better part of a year to the black community, the Hispanic community, the Pakistani community, the Indian community, the minority communities, if you will, in Philly that the, that the GOP has kind of walked away from. And many of, at least if you're talking about blacks and Hispanics, the Democrats have just assumed that these are kind of like their people, they somehow yeah. own them. And I use that word deliberately because I think that's the way they look at it. And so yeah. I was speaking to a group of Hispanic pastors. So there's like 50 of them in this uh, church and every one of them is the head of a large congregation in Philadelphia. So these are the leaders of, I don't know, tens of thousands of Hispanics in Philadelphia. And talking about the work of the coalition and sort of MAGA, America First movement and all of this stuff. Every single one of the people in that room was powerfully pro-Trump. And at the end of that thing, just give you a sense of, and I'm talking about a Hispanic audience where when I spoke, we had to have a translator to translate from English to Spanish to make sure everybody in the audience understood. Yeah. So this is not just like a bunch of people that their family might have come from Mexico 250 years ago, right? And at the end of this, to give you a sense of the mood, the head pastor who organized this thing has all of them together in the front of the church for literally sort of a laying on of the hands blessing as he prays over them to conclude this, right? Because it's a very evangelical service, if you will. And that, yeah. and that went on for probably 15 minutes in English and Spanish. 
and the message expressly coming out of his mouth that they were all responding to was tell everybody in all of your congregations vote for Donald Trump. Do not vote for the Democratic Party. This is the mo most important thing because why? Because the agenda pushed on things like transgender ideology, telling your son Juan that he's really a girl and he should go have surgery, this intervention yeah. between children and parents, the whole, the whole woke ideology has totally alienated these people that I'm sure some white liberal in Democratic Party headquarters thinks they're all for us. We can just count on them. And I'm telling you, I was just at ground level. We're now yeah. going out to speak into every one of those churches. And I'm talking, you know, this is an urban area. So this is not your rural Presbyterian church where they're 25 yeah, minutes, yeah. 25 people on Sunday morning. This is like a relatively modest one holds a thousand people on, on Sunday morning. Some of them, five, 10,000 people in these churches. So wow. this is a wow. mass movement and it's all because of the arrogance, mm -hmm. the overreach by these people that are shoving an ideology on the country. Nobody wants it. Well, I wouldn't say nobody wants it. The vast majority of Americans do not want it. You know, you, you're way, yeah. way, yeah. way out of bounds, government. One thing I think that the left really underestimates is the, the not just the importance, but the centrality of the nuclear family yes. with different ethnic groups, particularly Hispanics, uh, also uh, Muslims, mm -hmm. um, uh, you said Pakistani, mm -hmm. right? Indians, Pakistanis. Really, you know, the the absence of the nuclear family is is very much a Western yes. thing, and it, it was it was fostered. Uh, really, it was it was pushed and fostered by the abortion agenda and by the war on poverty in the Johnson administration. People may not know this, but during uh, under LBJ, that was when they started the war on poverty, and that is when they went into particularly into black homes. At the time that the war on poverty began, the uh, rate of black children being born out of wedlock was, I believe, 24%. Uh, now it is pushing 80%, I believe. Yes. And it's because of the policy uh, where they flat out told the mothers that the baby daddy could not be in the home. Yes. And that is when women started being incentivized to have children out of wedlock. Yes. Uh, and and the the results of that have been catastrophic. The life expectancy of an inner city black male, I believe, is what maybe twenty five. It, it's 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 phenomenal, and and so this idea that you can break up families and do through things like the transgender agenda is anathema to these different ethnic groups that are American, that have uh, established themselves in American society as Americans. You're right, I think it is, it's the peak of arrogance of the left to believe that they have these people as a captured audience because they've seen what's happened, uh, especially to the black population. I mean, you know, the, the black population in this country is a minority but it's even more of a minority because of the loss of at least 50 million black babies to abortion. Um, so think about the generations that have been lost because of abortion, because of the emphasis on abortion. And then again, also the early deaths, particularly of young black men, because of the prison culture that they're pushed into at a very early age. Um, and so if you really think about the racism, it's just blatant racism. And I, and I think people are waking up to that, to seeing that nothing that is being done, quote, you know, for them by the left is is of any benefit. In fact, it's destructive. Is that, is no, that I, look, I, are, were I'm you picking up on I that? Because I agree with you point by point. You're 100% right. Look, you can look at Baltimore as an example. I went to school college and law school in Baltimore. My mom's family is all from Maryland. I've been in and out of Baltimore, you know, my entire adult life, actually my whole life. Mm -hmm. So I use it as an example because it's a city I know very well and I've spent a lot of time and I love Baltimore. It's a great town. Yeah. Uh, 
parts of Baltimore are a horror show these these days. And the yeah. policies that we were just talking about have a have contributed immensely to that. You can you can go to West Baltimore out around Royal uh, Avenue, West Western you know Western part of the city. You'll be in an area that's overwhelmingly black. I mean, probably close to 100% black at this point. It's been a black area for a very long time. If you look at video, and you can find this online of, say, the mid-1960s, this would be at the height of segregation in Maryland, right? Which I am not defending. But I'm what I'm saying is that even given that you were then had legal discrimination against blacks, what you'll see is film of well-dressed families on the street, couples together, businesses, big music halls, department stores. By the way, these are all Black-owned businesses. Again, not suggesting that was a fixed system, legal just in Maryland. There were, there were beaches, if you were a Black person and wanted to go to in Maryland at that point in time, you'd run up and find a sign that says whites only. Okay, this was not paradise, but the point was, yeah, what you weren't seeing was nothing but empty businesses and dead bodies and life expectancy. If you're a young man, you're lucky if you see 25 years of age and you didn't have yeah. schools where literally nobody learns anything, you know. So this whole alleged war on poverty hasn't fixed anything. It just destroyed everything. It's laid waste to this. And I think that, that, you know, you can see the numbers in the black community. They're lagging behind the Hispanic community just because of political forces that have been in place for a really long time. But mm -hmm. very large numbers of people in the black community are walking away from these policies now. And I, right, when right. this stuff I'm talking about we're doing in Philadelphia, there are a number of really prominent black leaders that are participating in this. And man, if you're standing right. in the hall with them, I'm down there speaking. We're speaking together. I know these people. They're laying it on the line, man. They're talking to the audience, which is largely right. black, and saying, this is the poorest big, they're talking about Philly. This is the poorest big city in America. Your schools are a catastrophe. Let's walk on down all of this. 75 years of Democratic administrations in this city, and the only thing that happens is you get poorer, crime gets worse. The only time you see these guys is when they show up to smile in your face at election time and then they walk away. So the bill for the yeah. bill for a lot of these policies is coming is coming due and it good. Good, yeah, exactly. And and this is something that President Trump has really had a heart for. I believe during his first campaign in 2016 when he was traveling through the country, he saw firsthand the destruction yep. that has been wrought on m these cities and and I think it really shocked him because you know he's a he's a man of international uh savvy he owns properties abroad he he's been in the middle east he's he's been in airports all over the world and and one of the most shocking things to him is our infrastructure particularly urban infrastructure yep. and uh, everything from the subways to the airports to the the housing uh he did really emphasize something called opportunity zones during his first administration. And I think that that's something that he is going to bring back. Um, I, I really hope. Uh, but it's, it, you know, it's it's interesting. I'm, I'm really glad to see these leaders coming on board and, and really leading their congregations into a place of sanity. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's funny because the, the narrative that Trump is a racist and you know that he's bigoted and all of this, it's really falling apart. People are, are, are no longer being afraid to say, I'm a black man and I support President Trump. I mean, you see this with the rappers. A, a friend of mine is, is actually, right as we speak, staying at the Trump uh, Hotel in mm -hmm. Vegas. And she sent me a text. She said, you know, it's kind of amazing. She said, first of all, the hotel is fabulous, like all of his properties. But she said there is a huge number of black and Indian clientele at this hotel. <laughs> and um, why is that? Because they they not because they hate him. People who hate him don't stay at his hotels, um, you know, and they certainly aren't going to spend that much money at one of his properties 
if they if they hate him. So it's just very, very interesting. And I found that to be true when I was staying at the Trump Doral in uh, in Miami last May. A lot of his staff, a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of his staff are international. They're they're bilingual, sometimes trilingual, many from East Africa, like Ethiopia, because they speak multiple languages. There are people from Dominican uh, all over. And some and he, he has employees every time I've been to his properties, you see employees that have been there for years. And, and that's unusual in the hospitality industry but it's because they actually love working for him and they like his clientele. They said that our group that was there was, was one of the best groups they've ever had on the property. And it was, it was for the reawaken. Right. So, you know, all the stuff that you're hearing in the media and you're seeing that is vilifying him and, and trying to make him out to be the, this horrible person. It's just not true. The, the, the experience that people are living as a, an employee or a guest at a at a Trump property is the opposite of what you're hearing in um, in, in the media. I, I want to shift our conversation to some other things that are happening, particularly on the international front. You're tracking a lot of these things with your publication and magazine. Why don't we take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll shift our conversation as much as I love Trump. I could talk about him all day, but we do need to get some other topics on the board here. So everybody stick around. We just got a few little words from our affiliate partners. Remember that this is how we finance Mary Grace Media. So um, if you're taking a little break, don't turn the volume off. We'll be right back. And I am one of the biggest fans of my pillow because they have quality America first products that are just made right here in the country and they last. We have the towels and I have a big issue with towels that shrink up after the first washing. The MyPillow towels stay color fast, they stay in shape, and they stay that way for years after repeated washings. You can't ask for better, plus they actually work. When somebody buys from MyPillow using the promo code Mary Grace, that does a couple of things. It brings in a little bit of an affiliate commission to our company and it helps us to pay the bills, keep the lights on, keep the internet going, travel to places that we do to give you remote content. And it also helps MyPillow by giving them the support of people who genuinely value quality and companies that support real people right here in the United States and employ people all over this country and give back to this country. Go directly to MyPillow.com, use promo code Mary Grace, and buy everything you need for the home. There's no need to spend time shopping anywhere else. Go to MyPillow.com, use promo code Mary Grace, get your towels, pillows, sheets, robes, uh, dog beds, pet beds, cat beds, whatever it is that you want for the home, go to MyPillow.com, promo code Mary Grace. It's easy, don't waste your time anywhere else. MyPillow.com, promo code Mary Grace, thank you. Listen, your health is your best investment. We have a country to save, and we need people who are in the best shape of their lives, physically, mentally, spiritually. Why not connect with a team who cares about you on every single level from the inside out? Official Synapse is that team. OfficialSynapse.com. It's official, S-Y-N-A-P-S-E dot com. Tell them Mary Grace sent you, and they will treat you like family. If you're like most people, you really probably haven't thought about transferring your paper dollars into physical gold and silver. But I want to tell you a story. My friend Andrew Sorcini over at Beverly Hills Precious Metals, he recently went overseas and he wanted to buy a watch. He likes he likes fine watches. He took three currencies with him. He took gold, he took Bitcoin, and he took American dollars. Now, there used to be a time when the American dollar was king. I remember that when I used to travel overseas. Everybody wanted dollars. The people that he was dealing with would not take his dollars because the dollar is so devalued around the world. They wanted the gold. So this is what I recommend to you. I want you to think about this. If you have cash in the bank, if you have an investment account that you have worked hard for years to accumulate, 
consider the value of converting that money into physical gold and silver. You're not buying something that's losing value. You're changing those worthless dollars into a tangible physical asset that will go up in value, which it has done historically. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to bh-pm.com. The first thing you're going to do is schedule that free consultation. Second thing, just think rationally about this, pray about it, go to the Lord, see what the best decision for you and your family is. I can't tell you that. I don't want to pressure you into that. What I do know is don't be scared, be prepared. And so the third thing you want to do is make a decision for you and your family. Make a decision, take action. bh-pm.com. Let them know Mary Grace sent you. I just want to give a shout out to everybody who watches this show. Thank you for being a participant. Thank you for being a loyal audience member. I just want to remind you, if you like what you've seen, please share this and don't forget to subscribe, turn on your notifications, and also sign up for my email list so you never miss a show. We're back. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And again, thanks to everybody who supports us here at Mary Grace Media. I don't want to forget, we have one sponsor that isn't on that commercial, and this is amazing. A lot of you guys have already purchased Grid Down Chow Down. This is freeze-dried American-grown beef from American farmers and ranchers right in the heartland, also known as flyover country out in the Oklahoma area. Our friends, um, Jordan and Nace run this company. They started it during the pandemic. They realized that their freezers weren't always working when they stocked up on meat. So they started freeze drying. They invested in the equipment. You can order from them. You can get on their subscription model. Make sure that you tell them that Mary Grace sent you. Go to griddownchowdown.com. It is freeze-dried beef, and I got some. I just got some. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm going to make a video when I do. It's awesome, and they're great guys. So griddownchowdown.com. Get your freeze-dried beef. Don't get caught unaware. You can eat it now, or you can save it up to, I think it's like 15 years. Hopefully, you won't have to. There won't be like an apocalypse that lasts that long. But if there is, you'll have your freeze-dried beef. So enough with that. We're going to talk about, I don't know, should we talk about Sam? <laughs> um, what do we want to talk about? <laughs> uh, what is happening in the world of international politics and money laundering through our no longer illustrious Congress? How's that working out? You wrote, you put up an article about this recently. Yeah. This is the hard part, right? The whole world's on fire. Yeah. And uh, our government, if anything, is doing its best to make it happen. So it's hard to know where to start. Yeah. I wrote a piece that ran in the Baltimore Sun the other day, and that was essentially the theme. It was like any one of these things would be a massive crisis only a few years ago, and we'd be talking about nothing but. Right. It, and yet somehow the Biden administration doesn't, or the media don't want to talk about any of it. Yeah. Let's start with the Houthis. I mean, um, What's the deal with the Houthis? I mean, the Houthis, uh, for you know, for anybody who's playing catch up, are a group trying to take over Yemen, and they've taken over a very large portion of Yemen, and they are armed and trained and equipped by the Iranians, and they're actually directed in large measure by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. So these guys are joined at the hip with the Iranians, and they've been setting Yemen on fire for a very long time. Um, in the last few months, they started shooting at shipping in the Red Sea, effectively saying that they're going to close the Red Sea to shipping. Maybe maybe that's not particularly relevant to most Americans until you stop and look at a map and realize how much shipping that you do care about used to transit the Red Sea and go through the Suez Canal and what the impact of this is now because most of that commercial shipping, since there are missiles and drones flying out of Yemen, hitting ships and in fact sinking ships in the Red Sea. They're now sailing all the way around Africa. So the bottom line, guys, is that not only is it going to take a lot longer for you to get whatever that is you just ordered, but when you do get it, the cost of everything, again, is going to go up because that's time is money and fuel is money, and you are the folks who pay that in the end. In any event, this is part of a broader Iranian offensive around the Middle East. They've been shooting at our bases in the Middle East for some time. What are we doing? Um, you know, you could write this script since we've seen three years of Joe by this point. We've got U.S. Navy ships in the, the Red Sea. They shoot down Houthi drones. 
and missiles periodically that are fired both at them and at commercial ships. We periodically bomb something in Yemen, but what we actually bomb in Yemen when we bomb, you know, we hit a target and whether that target was an empty, was a sand dune or an empty lot or a building with nobody in it or an actual meaningful target, is anybody's guess and i think you would be safe to assume on most in most cases we're bombing things of no consequence so we're this this is a completely untenable situation it's already not funny it potentially is going to get a lot less amusing real fast so a couple of factors without getting lost in technical weeds we shoot down these drones that are made in the equivalent of a garage somewhere with missiles off of U.S. ships that cost about $2 million a pop. So every time we celebrate that we just blew up this hobby house drone coming in, carrying a bomb, it cost them maybe 50 grand charitably, and we just spent $2 million for every missile. The other day we were trumpeting the fact that we shot down 24 drones in the space of about an hour or two. So in that one engagement, do the math, that's about 50 million bucks you spent to do that. These destroyers that are firing these missiles, they have obviously a limited number of these missiles on board, right? I mean, it's a ship, there's not an infinite amount of space. They can't reload at sea, let me say that again. They left port, you got 50 missiles on board, I just pulled that number out of the thin air. When you fired all 50, until you get back to a port somewhere to reload, you're carrying a gun that doesn't have any bullets in it. So while the administration seems to think that it's funny that the Houthis fired 24 missiles, 24 drones, and we shot them all down, what they really ought to be thinking about is so probably a bunch of ships that are just about out of ammo floating around out there serving as targets. What I'm telling you is that it is entirely possible that any day now could happen today. One of these Houthi missiles or drones is going to hit a U.S. warship. Now, again, these things are big enough and carry a big enough warhead that they have sunk large commercial vessels. Keep in mind, those commercial vessels are actually two to three times the size of the warships we're talking about. So they have hit them and sent them to the bottom. So if you're thinking that this U.S. ship is a battleship and this thing's going to bounce off, that's wrong, guys. It's like a 700-pound warhead is going to hit this thing, and one of them may put it to the bottom. So one of them will certainly take it out of action. So, Now, do you think, can I ask you one thing? Do you think that our administration is, is uh, pushing for war? Or is this what they're doing? Are they engaging with the hopes of getting us into another perpetual war. I mean, because because Ukraine is is sort of fizzling out, and they didn't get us into the long term kinetic engagement that they wanted to. But it looks like, and we are in kinetic engagement right there in the Red we're Sea. Look, we're we what do you we're <laughs> you know you and I have this conversation in some way all the time on a whole variety of issues, which is let's just like can we have some plain speak. Can we just say some real stuff and stop fuzzing the language, right? For the love of God, sure. right? You're rigging elections and you're prosecuting Trump to pervert the legal system to destroy your political opponent. That's what's happening. Stop dancing around. What are you doing in the Red yeah. Sea? I think what you have is more than one interest. The Biden administration, a lot of them honestly side with the Iranians and the terrorists. And they feel compelled to do something for public relations purposes. Like it, it plays well to say we sent the Navy. But honestly, they don't really want to win the conflict. Now, and then you have the folks that are really powerful interests in D.C., like the defense industrial complex. That Nikki 100% is like, man, I don't care how many wars you start, because all I know is that sends our stock higher and we make more money. As I'm sitting on the board of directors and my contract says our profits are going up, I just made another $10 million off of sending your sons and daughters to die. So they'll do this for yeah. the rest of time. So it's like that. You talk about the swamp. It, the swamp is a toxic mix of all these things. The bottom line mm -hmm. is 
none of that is in is the only thing that should matter is what's best for the American people, and none of that is under consideration. Um, mm -hmm. What is China's involvement with Iran? They they cooperate. Is, they is that I mean they cooperate? They provide assistance. All of this is to their liking. I mean, every missile we spend. I mean, there's a whole other side to this, which is, by the way, there's no assembly line in Texas somewhere where every day they replace every one of those missiles we just fired. Like, we're burning through inventory of ordnance and giving ordnance to Ukraine at a rate that grossly exceeds our capacity to manufacture it. So you're emptying warehouses of munitions so that you know, you go to war with China tomorrow. There was a report the other day that said, we go to war with China tomorrow, we will expend all of our long range missiles that the Navy has within one week of combat based on projections. So after one week, you're gonna tell the guys and gals that are out there in harm's way, sorry, you don't have any ammo. And it's not gonna be like the ship will be here tomorrow. It's gonna be like, we just, we're talking about a contract to build a place so that maybe in three years you could this all across the board mm -hmm. this this is all catastrophic i mean right it's it's mm -hmm. this is right, existential right. stuff D and some u.s warship is hit and even doesn't go to the bottom but you just gotta hunt you could easily lose 150 sailors in one strike this administration mm -hmm. we've already seen doesn't care yeah. right when you got a father well, they, the yeah, they, the they union saying, want, you got yeah. my son killed for no good reason in Kabul. You took my kid and, and you don't care. And what the liberal media is offended by his lack of decorum in daring to call out the death. Of his son. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Joe Biden apologized for referring to a murderer as an illegal alien. Yeah, that's right. That, that a guy, br brutalized a guy a, who a, a attacked young girl. a young nursing student, and I don't want to get lost in the gory details, beat her with a weapon to the point where her skull was disfigured. In other yeah. words, crushed her skull yeah. in an unbelievably brutal attack. And the guy who claims to be president of the United States, he's scuttling to apologize for calling that monster an illegal. Yeah. Like his yeah. feelings were more relevant than the death of that woman. Sam, there are there are powerful voices, voices that I uh, ascribe to as being reasonable people, who are who have concerns about whether our election will go forward yep. in November, uh, because of the potential for either a a mass casualty terrorist related yes. event, possibly possibly a, a medical related event. I, I think they're too late to the draw for that type of thing, um, or even a kinetic event, uh, kinetic warfare on our shores, which would call for deployment of the military, um, for martial law that they, so they, they, there's, there would, there would be some excuse for suspending our elections. What is your Intel, uh, indicating on this? Are, are you well, first of all, let me say that this? I have associates of mine, longtime friends of mine. So we aren't talking about the tin foil hat crowd. We're talking about guys right. and gals who serious people, very serious people who've been in harm's way for a very long time and are very sober judges of of things and yeah. don't have time for nonsense. Who believe there will not be an election in the fall. So I I, I have told me that. Do I yeah. currently subscribe? Do I do I think that's likely? I I don't. But as I've said to you face to face many times, I think there's all kinds of stuff that happens all the time now that I know to be true. And if five years ago you told me it was true, I would say, yeah, a plot of a bad novel, or you've had too much coffee, or something else is in your coffee. Sure. And now I know it's true. So yeah. who can say yeah. what's uh, nothing is off the table. I would say I would break down the threats into two categories. One would be an administration. Or let's just use that's administration. Short a loose for much more than regime, but you got a bunch of folks who have, as we were just talking about at, at length, 
decided to use the criminal justice system and the legal system against a political opponent and try to put him in jail and so forth, things that are unthinkable. So is it really impossible to believe that these guys would drum up an excuse to suspend an election? I mean, that's the way they'll announce it. They won't say there's never going to be another election. They'll say, we're suspending it until conditions are better. And that's that's the way that works. Then you realize it's been suspended indefinitely. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is that there really is there really is a series of terrorist attacks on U.S. soil that make it virtually impossible to carry out an election. Not because those guys did it, I'm not, but because we have no border, we have no security, or we're not doing. Afghanistan is a terrorist super state. Al Qaeda is back in spades. They, some of their senior members are now part of the Taliban government. The border doesn't exist. Look, the FBI announced a week ago the equivalent of an APB, right? They put out to the entire country, they said there's this guy, Majid Farahani. Majid Farahani is an MOIS officer. MOIS is an acronym. Basically, he's an Iranian intel guy. And if you look at the info they put out on this guy, this is not some this, this is not some newbie. This is a seasoned operator of Iranian intelligence who speaks multiple languages, operates out of Venezuela, I assume has access to Venezuelan false identity documents. He's on our soil and he is actively organizing an effort to kill multiple former Trump officials who are, in fact, at least two of them under Secret Service protection. So they put out an APB. And, and that's not including the ones they're sending. Oh, right. So this, I'm just using this guy as, as an example. This guy is, doesn't mm -hmm. represent the scope yeah. of the problem. Yeah. The point is. They put out this effect, I say APB, it's not technically an all points bulletin, but the point is the FBI found it necessary to put out a notice to the entire American population with this dude's picture saying we can't find this guy who's trying to assassinate top officials. But they can find they can find somebody's grandma who innocently walked into the oh, yeah. U.S. Capitol but with the, with a sincere belief that it was open to the public. They can find her. I remember her. after January 6th, not yeah. too long after that, driving down to the Outer Banks in North Carolina just to get away with the weekend, for the weekend with my wife. And on the road out onto the uh, the island, out onto Hatteras, they got those video display signs put up alongside the road showing the pictures of people that they're hunting down for January 6th. Wow. But they can't find, they apparently can't wow. find this dude. So they have to basically say to the Americans, population, help us. It's been a week. This guy's on American soil by their own admission, organizing right now assassinations of former Trump officials, John Bolton, um, two or three others whose names escape me right now. At least two of them are under continuous wow. Secret Service protection. So this is not a speculative thing. Mm -hmm. They're so worried that they got these guys locked down with guys with guns outside. They couldn't find him without on their own. And in a week, even with the help of the entire American population, they can't find that one guy. Now, your border doesn't exist. None of your borders exist anymore. And nobody has any idea who's coming in. So they can't find this one guy. But for all we know, there could be a thousand such guys. Who knows how many Right. Times? Well, and now we have, now we have, yeah, now we have Haitian felons um, yes. coming to our shores. Now, right, and by the way, the plan for dealing with the Haitian boat people, if that's the right expression, what they actually refer to as a potential mass migration, the official yeah. plan is the Coast Guard will intercept those vessels at sea, and you probably are thinking I'm about to say, or you would have once upon a time, turn them, turn them around, but no... The Coast Guard will escort them into shore in the United States to make sure they get to land. So the mission of your Coast Guard is to go out to sea, find the boat filled with 300 Haitians getting ready to enter the country illegally, and make sure they get here. That's I'm, I didn't make that up. That's I, official. I, I feel like we're living in bizarro world. I mean, I agree. Okay, listen, we need a palate cleanser. Hold on a second. <laughs> just, just wait. I didn't have time to upload it, but I can hold it up to the screen because 
here we go. Hold on. Just, okay. Just everybody just, you know. There you go. A, a moment of Zen. Is that what that is? Yeah. Isn't he just the cutest? Is that a real dog? That looks like animatronic. Yes. It's real. No, it's a little puppy. He was on my, I put it on Facebook and Instagram. One of my friends, MJ Truth, he puts up videos like this every day because, you know, everything is so serious. He puts up these little palate cleansers. So there you go. Okay. Woo. Good move. Woo. So, yeah, I know. Goodness. Why don't we, <laughs> it, we're coming up to time yeah. here. Um, I don't know what kind of puppy it is. Somebody asked me if I got it for my birthday. It was my birthday this week. Happy birthday. Um, I didn't I know did that. Not you get didn't tell me that. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, Tuesday. I didn't get a puppy, um, but I, I did get family visiting, and, and that was just awesome. Nice. We had my my sister was here. She came to stay with my dad because I was on a trade on a couple days extra, and then her two adult children came. Some of my listeners have actually seen both of them on video with me at various times, and uh, so we, we had a great time. We had a little birthday celebration yeah. on, on Sunday, and... Um, yeah, it was just nice. Just really, really nice that I couldn't ask for anything better. And uh, so that that's a good, that's a good, you thing know, I happen. think, I think you're, you're very wise. Um, I, I understand sometimes we get into talking about really deep, depressing, heavy subjects, and it gets easy to end up sin, sounding like the Grim Reaper. Uh, you can't keep your sanity if you don't find ways to punch out of that. Um, yeah. I can remember one day in in Iraq, you know, in before the, well, when we had already been in country, my team for a very long time, and the, officially the war hadn't yet started, although it started for us a long time before. And I'm at the team house, and the communicator is there, and the communicator, of course, I mean, the team is running around, but the communicator has to live with his com commo gear. It, literally, he sleeps in a bed next to yeah. his gear and all this. You know, it's that's the most sensitive part of the operation and sure. it's never out of sight. And um, he was going crazy and I was going crazy because all I'm doing is sleeping three hours a night and just running flat out like everybody else. And um, the only one of the very few things we managed to find in country was we actually got Turkish ice cream that came in. That probably doesn't sound like much of a sound like much of a delicacy no. but for us. That was yeah. the big deal, man. If you could find a, a, an actual ice cream bar in the midst of all this madness. And there was a local store that had run out of it. And I think it was because the Turks had closed the border. And so there wasn't any. And I, I grabbed the uh, communicator who I called Radar, not particularly original. And I, and I said, somebody else is going to watch the comms gear. And you and I are going on an ice cream bar hunt. <laughs> And he and I, you know, with our guns and everything, get in the vehicle. We're up in the mountains in the middle yeah. of Kurdistan. And we just, these two crazy white boys go careening around the mountains of Kurdistan, you know, with our, our rifles and guns going in and out of every every grocery store and rummaging through their, you know, their little like cooler type freezers yeah. that they have. Yeah. These are all little tiny stores digging for Turkish ice cream bars until we finally find in some remote <laughs> valley, like the last guy in yeah. Mount Kurdistan who still has a box of ice cream bars. And that was our, you know, that uh, yeah. contribute nothing to the war effort other than keeping us sane by doing something yeah. crazy. Yeah. For morale is, and I think this is, it's really, I'm glad you, you said this because morale is so important. And sometimes, uh, you know, when, when, when I put up memes or funny things, not so much the puppies, but sometimes when I put up memes that are kind of edgy, people yes. get upset, you know, and they yes. say, you know, we're at war and bad things are happening and how can you laugh? And, and it's, it's, you have to laugh. And the Bible even says that God laughs at his enemies. And, and so it's, you got what, to what we're doing is biblical, you know, it releases endorphins. It, it actually helps you stay healthy and sane. You can't, and, you, you can't yeah. do it otherwise. I, my, my logs officer in Iraq, who's a dear friend, you know, it, Hispanic guy out of Southern California, who's, whose call sign was, was Lobo. His, you know, his oh. deal would be to be riding down the street in the mountains of Iraq and going through some mud hut village and put low rider on the radio, on, you know, and his yeah. CD player in his car and crank yeah. the windows down and start, yeah. you know, and calling out to the kids going through the street because it's, 
Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. You can't, I, I guarantee you if people were playing practical jokes at Valley Forge and joking and finding some time, you, you can't function yeah. otherwise. Yeah. And you have and it's to. it's critical because as you and I both know, this is a huge issue in the Patriot movement right now. You got people that got fired up. They got involved. And I guess they thought they were going to win the war by Christmas, to use the old analogy. And it didn't happen. Yeah. So now they're in the they're in despair. They've gone into just fallen into the mm -hmm. bog and they're combat ineffective now. And they're just like, there's woe is me. There's no hope. You can't yeah. be like that. And that's yeah, yeah. You you in the in the world of Eeyore's be Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. There is um, a much, as usual, a much more succinct way to say what it just took me five minutes to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it just came to me but but seriously the other thing too i really want to encourage people i don't know about where you are but my garden is just full of flowers and i if you notice i i keep glancing over this way it's because i can see my dad out there he's he's out there doing something in the garden i don't know what but he's outside and uh, <laughs> it's it's anybody's guess, but you know he's out there. Uh, we've been out there a lot. We actually have some nice outdoor furniture that we can enjoy, rain or shine. And I really just encourage people get outside, uh, get your hands in the dirt, take your shoes off if you can, um, take a drive out, you know, away from your environment if you can get to the mountains, get to the water, go somewhere. If it, even if it's just a little break from where you are. We have neighbors that I just discovered who have a little koi pond and it's in the most unlikely pl place. And sometimes when I'm on my walk, I just stop and look at their little koi pond. <laughs> and, um, and it's just things like that, that it, it, you know, you don't have to take a vacation, but to get, make intentional, be intentional about taking a mini vacation. And then of course, always think about what you're listening to. Think about the music you're playing. Is it uplifting? Is it, is it godly? You know, is it, I, I know low rider. I mean, that's a classic. So, but, um, but you know, are you listening to worship music? Are you listening to things that are getting you to a better place? Right. Uh, because it really matters guys. And, uh, and so I think we all know that, but we forget. And so just put your phone down, take time away, get in the fresh air and then do do something that makes you laugh, you know, and, and that includes what you're watching. If you're watching things on TV that are violent or that are just filled with tons of immorality, that affects you. And, you know, we've been watching, I watch things with my dad. We've, we've been finding shows from 20, 30 years ago that don't have the agendas that you have yes. now. And they're just so wholesome, you know? And it's good story. It's good writing. And they're they're not trying to push an agenda. So there's ways, you know, we, we want people to be informed, but we don't want people to have a 24-7 diet of doom. No. That's not good for anybody. No. You can't you can't do that. And I appreciate your comments about what you're watching because you know, Gina and I were watching some program. We were flipping through the channels just looking to watch some movie just to kind of tune out right and we put on some film that i had never heard of and good lord five minutes into this film i've watched like 17 people get murdered in graphic fashion and look i mean both of us have lived lives where we've seen a lot of unpleasant things and i don't need that i don't right yeah. i don't i i don't need that i don't find it entertaining in fact, I feel like the more you've been around violence, the less I want that. It's like, no, man, that's yeah, that's not cool because yeah. when that happens in real life, there's no neat music playing in the background and the hero doesn't always win. And we just turn and yeah. I just we just shut it off. We're like, look, I'll find something else. I'm not I'm not letting you pump yeah. this stuff into my head or exactly some other movie we were watching that was theoretically a comedy. And about five minutes into yeah. that, there's been about 17 jokes, which are all really crude sexual references. Again, yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay, it's, it's crazy. I've lived in the real world for a, in a, a long time and been around some really ugly stuff. That's, I don't want that. I don't want, I don't need that in my head, right? Yeah. Now, you you yeah. take your garbage and go somewhere else, man. I'm going to watch something, 
something that makes yeah, you feel exactly. good at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we've been doing. You know, we've been finding these series. Um, interestingly, one of the best ones we watched was a series about women surfing because I mm -hmm. lived in Hawaii. And so the, this is a documentary that was done about women on the world tour of surfing. Cool. And it's just, you know, it's beautiful footage, you know, great stories, following their lives, following their families. Um, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's like, oh, <laughs> surfing, yeah. you know, and, um, and, you know, and it's just, you know, there's, there's no agenda. It's just, this is just the life of professional athletes who are doing a sport that many, many years was, was cut off to women and, 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 yeah, sure. you know, so, you know, there's other issues with it, but the, but the documentary itself was fantastic. So, um, things like that, you know, and it, it's, it's a little bit harder to find, but, oh, and then the all creatures great and small, that series through PBS, we watched that. I mean, we could go down the list. If you, if you're listening and you have a good series or film that you've watched that fits these, um, the description of what we're talking about that, that doesn't subject people to a political narrative or a woke narrative, please put it in the chat so other people can find it. Um, you know, we, we don't want to spend all of our time binge watching stuff, but sometimes it is nice to just have a family night and have a break. Um, and to, to watch things that are politically incorrect. And usually they're from a long time ago, but there are, there is some recent things that are coming out, um, that are, are, are pretty nice to watch. So anything, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm serious about this anywhere you're watching in the comments, just put, put what you're watching and, uh, other people can have an opportunity to take advantage of that. Sam Faddis, Sam, the spy, where can people find you uh, and interact with you and where can they see your content? So the best place to go to find me on the net is to go to and magazine, which is the magazine that Gina and I run, as you know, andmagazine.substack.com, andmagazine.substack.com, um, which is where we post a lot of content, but also that'll take you from there to every place else i am on the web facebook and twitter and uh and wherever and uh, and part and uh where else getter and truth social and gab and but whatever a and d magazine is the best place to start and that'll get you everywhere else awesome uh final words for our listeners today stay in the fight man that you know you hear guys that are vets say that it doesn't just mean keep trying it means we don't there we do not acknowledge the possibility of defeat those people that think that we're going to quit or they're going to beat us those are the ones that on some level you feel sorry for i don't know how long it will take i just know it's not over until we win excellent i love that and uh thank you again to all of my listeners it's always wonderful to see your comments in the chat this is why i really like doing live shows so that we can interact with you uh i i do post other content that it has not been streamed live yet. So please go back on my platforms. I've posted a few items this week that get really pushed down by the algorithm. I had a great interview with Clay Clark. I also had an interview with a fellow named John Bush, who is teaching people how to uh, sort of get out of the rat race and um, do things like buy property together and live off grid and, and more of the homesteading type focus uh, and, and living parallel economies. That was a great video. It just didn't get the play that it needed because of the algorithm. So go back and watch that. It was posted yesterday or the day before. Also, I have an interview coming up tomorrow night with our friend Scotty Sachs, who has spent years and years in the media and entertainment industry. You guys have really enjoyed our shows with him. And we're going to have a live conversation with him Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on all of my streaming channels. So please uh, come back and watch that. And again, put your suggestions in the chat of wholesome shows, reruns, uh, new movies, series that you and your family have enjoyed um, that you don't feel like you have to wash your mouth out with soap after you watch them. So everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you again for being here. And as always, Sam Faddis, Sam the Spy, Thank you for being here. It's just been a great time. Everybody have a great afternoon. Get outside and enjoy the day.